Shall we start, Beth? Sure. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, EDGS grad, uh, speaker series. My name is Dika Utama. I'm a PhD candidate in sociology at Northwestern and an Ariman Scholar at Equality Development Globalization Studies. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to our first uh, speaker series for this year. We have an exciting uh, lines up. So this year we are inviting uh, book authors who recently published their amazing works in university press. And uh, we will have this once a month throughout the year. So please tune in for our next uh, speaker series as well. We will have Dr. Intan Suwandi from uh, Illinois State University who will share with us her recent uh, book project, uh, UK, uh, sorry, Value Chains, that's the title of the book. Uh, our speaker today, I'm very excited to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Arnold uh, van der Meer. Uh, he is an associate professor of history at Colby College. It is a liberal arts college in Maine, USA, a beautiful part of the uh, United States, where he teaches and studies Indonesian, studies Asian and the world history. His current research focuses on the proliferations of annual fairs in Southeast Asia, for instance, in Jakarta, Manila, and Hanoi during the late colonial period. Dr. Van der Meer received his doctoral degree from Rutgers University and MA from Leiden University. He was also a research fellow at uh, the Royal Netherlands Institute for Southeast Asians and Caribbean Studies, KITLV. Uh, his book that he's going to share today, titled Performing Power, Cultural Hegemony, Identity, and Resistance in Colonial Indonesia, published by Cornell University Press in 2021, so fresh from the uh, print, uh, explores the ways in which colonialism was legitimized and contested through everyday interactions, language, manners, material status symbols, and even physical gestures and posture in 19th and early 20th century colonial Indonesia. So we will uh, have Dr. Uh, Arnaud to speak for about ter uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Then we will open up uh, the Q&A. I will keep uh, the queue. If you will have any questions, uh, please uh, raise your hand or wave at me uh, in the chat. And if you would love to, we will really appreciate it if you can turn your camera as well so we can make these online interactions more uh, pleasant. And Following this talk, uh, we will have five minutes break. And if you are interested to join uh, us, graduate students at Northwestern, to uh, speak uh, with Dr. Van der Meer in a separate forum about uh, publishing a uh, book, turning dissertations into a book, and any other questions you have, you might want to stay around uh, longer. Uh, meanwhile, we are going to give the room and stage to Dr. Arnold Van der Meer. So thank you so much, Dika, for, for this wonderful introduction. And uh, uh, thank you so much all for, for being here with me this morning. Um, I realize it's, especially uh, in Chicago, it's it's early morning still, 9 a.m. Uh, here in Maine, it's 10. So I, I have a, a, a little bit of a head start on, on you. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me and also for the Equality Development and Globalization Studies speaker series for thinking of me and my new book. Um, and I look forward this morning to sharing some, um, some of my, my main insights from that work uh, with all of you. Um, so what I'll do is I'll share my, um, um, I, I've created a, a PowerPoint to do so. So I'll share my screen with all of you and I hope you can all um, see it. So one of the, the big challenges, at least you know, for me, is I, I love talking, of course, about my research and about my work, but one of the big challenges is, well, how do you talk about a whole book in about 30 minutes? Um, that's not that straightforward. So what I am planning on doing today is use a single case study um, of a one particular example from my book. And I'm gonna elaborate on that case study to hopefully convey some of the larger, um, basically, I wouldn't really say discoveries, but some of the larger takeaways from my work. Um, so I think that's probably the most effective way for me to talk about what I've tried to do in the book and what I've tried to um, convey. Um, so again, thank you so much. I'll, uh, uh, um, I'll let's see, uh, PowerPoint, there we go. Yes, there was a slow response here. Um, so what I want to share with you is first a story. And, and I think that's hopefully helpful in setting up some of my larger aims. 
Um, and that story might be familiar to those of you who have read the book or who, are, who have perhaps read one of my articles. Um, but it's a story about a young Japanese public prosecutor, and his name was Sumer Sono. And um, Sumer Sono has a really interesting history. And, and the reason that we know of this history is because uh, his experiences are really well recorded in the colonial archives of what is called the Office for the Advisor of Native Affairs. Um, and I'll come back to why this is important. But therefore, we have a lot of information about his personal life and his personal experiences in the civil service. And one of those experiences is where I want to start today. So in February 1913, Sumer Sono actually leaves uh, Batavia, present-day Jakarta, to take on a job in Purwakarta, a, a much smaller, more provincial town at the time in the interior of Java. And here he encounters a really bizarre situation. So he is dressed in European clothing, and while he approaches his new European superior, he discovers that everybody around him is offering this European superior all kinds of traditional Javanese deference. So people are sitting on the floor, they're all wearing traditional clothes like a sarong, um, they're also offering him signs of obedience, and they're addressing him in high Javanese. Um, and then this European official responds in low Javanese. Um, Sumersono, however, wears trousers, he wears a suit, uh, he addresses this European superior in Dutch, um, and he's, he's basically expecting to be seated on a chair. The moment these two men meet, at least from the archival record, it becomes clear that there is an incredible tension. The European superior demands that Sumersono immediately go back home and change his clothing and his outfit and wears traditional Japanese dress. He also refuses Sumersono to sit on a chair. What happens next is, a couple of tense minutes in which the European superior argues that, well, you can stay for now wearing your European clothing, but you have to speak to me in Javanese and you have to keep standing. If you're not sitting on the floor, I'm not going to give you a chair. You have to stand for the in the entirety of the meeting. To which Sumer Sono says, thank you. And he actually walks away. Um, so it's an incredibly interesting um, kind of encounter between two people in the colonial context um, and one that really caught my attention. So what is the, the, um, the relevance of this? Let me see, there we go. Okay, sorry, I have problems with the PowerPoint, but now I, now I, know, what to, now, now I know what to do. Um, so what is the relevance of this encounter? Because I think for me, this encounter kind of encapsulates some of the things that I'm interested in in my work. Um, and as Dika was kind enough to, um, to share, the title of the book is Performing Power, Cultural Hegemony, Identity and Resistance in Colonial Indonesia. And here what we have is a really good um, example of, um, of this particular form of, of the performance of power. What I am most interested in is uh, what I call the everyday staging and the performance of power through these everyday encounters. How is power communicated? How is power legitimized in the everyday encounter? And what we see here between um, Sumer Sono and his European superior is just that. We see competing expectations or competing assumptions. The European official clearly expects to receive traditional Japanese forms of deference, to elevate his status, to confirm his status in society, uh, and to reaffirm colonial categories of class, race, gender, um, whereas Sumer Sono is doing quite the opposite. His assumption is I'm speaking, your, I'm speaking Dutch, I'm wearing European clothing, I expect to be seated on a chair. Um, he is signaling his desire to be seen as a fully equal, as a modern uh, human being, as somebody who needs to be treated with respect. And these competing assumptions to me are really fascinating and because they're happening not um, uh, they're, they're happening in, in everyday encounters, right? They're happening all over the place, but this one is really well um, recorded. So that's why I speak elaborately about it today, but also in my book. So one of the, the I think the takeaways of encounters like this is that in my mind, hegemony or colonial power was communicated in various ways in colonial societies, right? Through language and manners and status symbols, physical gestures and posture. Um, and in a way, that's what I'm interested in. That's for me, the performance of power. And these, performances were really meant to strengthen colonial hierarchies of race, class, and gender. But what is so interesting about the example between Sumer Sonu and his superior is that it also shows it's not just a way for the colonizer to legitimize their power, but also really a way for the colonized to resist, to negotiate, um, and to subvert colonial hierarchies. So quite the opposite. So what we have here is, I think, a kind of a, a, a really discursive space within colonial society that, to my mind at least, was um, very much understudied um, and, and misunderstood often, as I'll um, try to explain later today. 
Um, so the image that I have here, I don't have an image of Sumersono um, or of his European superior and, and his confrontation, but I do have another image that I think captures that same kind of tension. Um, it's also from the book, it's from the epilogue in the book, and it's from the pawn shop strike of 1922. And here we see, and I don't want to talk about the strike itself, I can do so later in the Q&A if you would like me to, but here what I just want to illustrate is again this tension um, exemplified in dress and clothing, for instance. So here we see, for instance, um, we see how uh, uh, two uh, um, Japanese young men are dressed in European suits and they kind of look arrogant, they kind of look haughty. These are the people are strike, they're the strikers. Um, and this is how the European press is depicting them, right? So, so they're, they're seen out of place, really. Um, instead, the strike breaker, the people who are being brought in to break the strike, is depicted as somebody dressed in traditional Japanese clothes. And he looks much more respectable. He looks reliable. Um, it's almost as if this Dutch cartoonist is saying, this is the natural order of things. So we can see how there's this tension about clothing and about dress and about attitude, performance, mannerisms, posture. Um, and this image captures that. Um, another image that I, I would like to present to you is this one. This is from a uh, another uh, Dutch newspaper um, where we have a reference to the importance of language in all of this. And this too is something that we, we kind of always knew, but never quite um, um, emphasized, uh, I think in historical work thus far. In this particular case, we see here um, a advertisement for a Sundanese language course. And Sundanese like Javanese has uh, various uh, um, speech levels. And in this case, the implication is very clear. If you as a Dutch, uh, in this case, a planter, don't speak the local language, you will not be receiving respect. So in this case, we see the farmer, the person working on a farm, he's standing, he's holding his tools, he's still wearing his hat, he's smoking. Um, whereas the moment, of course, that this Dutch planter would speak Sundanese or by extension Javanese, um, in this case, what we see happening is that uh, the indigenous worker is shown to sit on the floor uh, in a gesture, holds his hands in a gesture of obedience and respect. Um, he has put his hat off, he's put his tools down. Um, so clearly the same um, basically implication of that example that we've just seen with um, Sumer Sono. Um, so this is very pervasive in colonial society, uh, these, these, the importance of these everyday, kind of these everyday forms. So for me, this is really what I set out to do then, is to study the various ways in which power was communicated, legitimized, negotiated, and subverted in everyday colonial encounters. Um, and that was a kind of a tricky task, because how do you find these stories? Some of them are, are in the archives, but others are a bit more difficult to find. So I had to look in places like uh, um, censorship reports. I looked in elaborate reports on the vernacular press that led me then to articles uh, into the vernacular press. Um, I had to go through things as, uh, uh, literature, um, books, novels, um, also um, biographies. It's been a, a, quite a journey to find enough examples of these kinds of experiences and put them together and try to make sense of them. Uh, and I would love to talk more about you know, that process also today. Um, one of the things that, that I noticed as I was doing this project is that uh, it really kind of took me away from examples of outright political resistance. So one of the uh, things that I noticed in the uh, scholarship is that there is a there's an incredible body of work on um, scholarship that focuses on outright political resistance. These could be either rebellions, or these could be revolts, or these could be strikes, or these could be political rallies, or the history of political associations. Um, and, and, and for good reason, these are really important histories that we need to understand. But on the one hand, there is, as the historian Jan Bremen, who, who some of you might know, he's uh, from the Netherlands, and he, he works on systems of economic exploitation. Um, and he argued that the problem with this uh, focus on outright political resistance is that it almost leads to the assumption that in between moments of outright political resistance, colonialism was passively endured. So we have these, these, these outbursts of resistance, but then in between those, um, there is this passive endurance. But the focus on the everyday encounter, the performance of power actually shows that colonialism is always contested, that there's this continuous cultural struggle. Um, and it's that continuous cultural struggle that I try to um, basically bring to the fore. And that, that was the main um, kind of focus of my work. Um, that also leads you to different spaces in colonial society. Um, so it basically forces me to think about where do I find examples, not just in the archives, but also where might these, uh, these encounters have happened and been recorded. Um, so for instance, for those of you who have looked at my book, uh, yes, the civil service is a really big part of this 
but it has to do with the archives. There's a lot of information on the civil service, but we can also think of train stations, pawn shops, uh, movie theaters, regular theaters, fairgrounds, the streets, shops. Um, I can go on. There's a whole lot of spaces that suddenly come into focus where you could look to study these everyday encounters between colonizer and colonized. Um, and that's what I've tried to do in this work as well, trying to bring into the conversation spaces that otherwise might we, we might have missed so far in, in this history. Um, the other big takeaway from, from this research for me was that it created a, a kind of a, a historical narrative that is not uh, just about a national awakening that is led by a by a small elite that is a top-down national awakening. Rather, I think what the focus on the performance of or the everyday encounter uh, demonstrates is that um, there is a continuous struggle against colonialism that is society-wide. This is a really broad societal struggle against uh, the colonizer. And it is only if we understand that context that we can actually understand uh, that to an extent the national awakening also emerges from the bottom up. Um, and I think I'm not necessarily or directly challenging these older notions of more kind of more than traditional narrative of a top-down movement, but I think I feel like I'm contextualizing them. I think they become much more logical, they make much more sense once we really understand this broader societal context of societal struggle, societal resistance um, in the everyday encounter. And it's from those experiences that we can then see the emergence of groups like um, Buryotomo or Sarakat Aslam or other movements later on. And, and that's kind of the contextualization that I think that um, my book offers. At least that's what, I, that's what I'm hoping, of course. That's what I'm trying to, to argue. So in this case, I'll, I'll give you a quick uh, overview of the book and of um, what, what I try to do. So for the performance of power, as I call it, uh, essentially, I, I try to think of it in my mind as a performance in three acts. And um, that, that idea came to me when I was writing my epilogue. So for those, again, of you who've seen the epilogue, I, I sort of play around with that notion of several acts there. Um, but you can also simply say, I've divided my book into three parts uh, and, and each part consists of two chapters, right? So um, this is more, I'm trying to have a more elegant way here of saying it, the first act, the second and the third, each with two scenes. But these are six chapters of my book. Um, but I think this is a helpful way of, of explaining to you how I, I was thinking about approaching this particular project. So for me, the first act is really focusing. So these are the first two chapters of my book. It's really focusing on how did the Dutch colonizer try to create forcefully and intentionally create what I call a hegemonic script. Uh, and this is loosely based on, on the work of James Scott. And um, for those of you who are familiar with the work of James Scott, this is loosely based on, on that. Um, how are they trying to create a, a world in which they could use, let's say, Javanese different rituals to legitimize colonial authority? Uh, and that's actually the chapter or the topic of chapter one, which is what I call the Javanization of power in the 19th century. The second scene of this first phase is um, a shift towards a more modern narrative, which um, we know in, in general terms of the civilizing mission ideology or the civilizing mission discourse. In the case of colonial Indonesia, uh, the Dutch called the ethical policy. And the ethical policy is based on this assumption um, of, of Dutch modernity, of Dutch uh, superiority, which bestows upon them a moral duty to uplift um, colonial Indonesia. Um, but of course, also it underlies a, a deep racial divide, a belief of a enduring difference between colonizer and colonized. What is so interesting about this moment in time is that, uh, as I write in chapter two, is that in this moment, we see that the Dutch are trying to change the hegemonic script, try to modernize it, try to basically change the appearance of colonial power, uh, make it more modern. But there's a fierce resistance um, from both colonial officials, um, but also Javanese officials against this. And as a consequence, what we see is that, that it is really difficult to implement these changes. Um, and that's what that second chapter is about. The attempts of creating a more modern script, but it fails, right? Colonial officials are not on board. Um, and that creates a lot of tension and anxiety in society. And it requires a new group of people to actually break through that is gonna demand and force this change. And that brings us back to Sumersono, the person that we just met earlier in, um, uh, uh, in this talk. Um, and that sets the stage for what I call act two. Um, and act two is really a moment where, where I think we go from everyday resistance to a broad national awakening. And Sumersono plays a role in this, but, but with him, many, many others. And uh, he's, again, he's, I use him because his example is so striking and I have so much information on him. Um, 
But essentially it is young Indonesians who are demanding change through everyday uh, encounters, everyday discursive encounters. Um, and that forces the Dutch colonial state to finally change its hegemonic script. So it's not the state itself that changes, it's actually the pressure from society that forces a Dutch state to do so. And I think that's a really kind of an innovative way to think about what is happening here and uh, what's happening with the ethical policy. Um, here too, I have two chapters. One is really focused actually on the story of Sumer Sono. That's chapter three, um, which I call the disturbance of the colonial uh, performance of power. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, in, in a little bit. Um, chapter four really looks at clothing and dress. Um, clothing, as you already could gather from also the experience of Sumer Sono, plays a really important role in signaling one's status or signaling one's um, refusal, let's say, to be treated as uh, uh, inferior. So clothing becomes an incredibly important battlefield. And um, this is not so, one of my big arguments in that chapter on clothing, this is not merely about, let's say, dandyism, right? This is not so, just about uh, a new consumer culture or not just about a fascination with modernity. Clothing is incredibly important in making statements about demanding equality. Um, and that's what chapter four deals with. Um, as I try to explain in my book, after this, what I can see is, the everyday encounter changes again for various reasons, but the 1920s and 1930s are a very distinct period in Indonesian history, uh, where of course we have a much more repressive colonial state. Also, we see that increasingly the Dutch are emphasizing their own modernity um, to really strike that difference between themselves and the colonizers. So they're fully moved away right now from what I call the Javanization of power from the 19th century. And what happens here is that both are, the Dutch are trying to then forge a modern identity for themselves that helps them legitimize power, but in response to that, increasingly Indonesians, and this is a bit more familiar territory from other studies, are doing the same thing. They are no longer um, accepting that they can be modern, but now they're basically trying to formulate their own modernity. Um, and that often depends on, on their own particular views in life, whether they are focusing more on, on their Islamic identity or on a political ideology as their identity or more the notion of a broad nationalism as an identity. Um, this is a moment of many competing identities, and they're all performed in the everyday encounter through clothing, through, uh, to, through uh, consumer manners, through lifestyle choices, uh, through views on mixed marriage or concubinage. Um, and that's what chapter five really deals with, all of those kinds of issues in society, the, the, the competition between these identities and as they are being performed. Um, and our final chapter is, is dealing uh, with the same topic in a different way, is really by looking at a particular space. And that space is the colonial fairground. And at the colonial fairground, I argue, we can really see how um, both on the one hand, the Dutch are trying to legitimize their authority, their power, but on the other hand, uh, the, the vast majority of visitors to these fairs are Indonesians, and they are finding all kinds of original ways of contesting Dutch colonial power and hegemony. Um, so that's what chapter six does. So this is kind of a, a big overview of what I then call the performance of power in, in colonial Indonesia in three acts. Um, today, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about this. I won't be able to talk about all of these acts uh, um, as extensively, also given the time, but uh, I'll try to you know, give you a quick sense of, of some of the main takeaways of each of these. Um, so first, if I want to backtrack a little bit, I want to, to again bring back into our minds that, that encounter that Sumer Soto had with his European superior and the competing assumptions that I think underlie that particular encounter. The assumption of the European official is best understood as a consequence of a long 19th century attempt of trying to legitimize Dutch colonial power by adopting Japanese uh, deference rituals and status symbols. Um, in chapter one, I, I elaborately um, describe how this happens slowly but surely, also as part, for instance, of the cultivation system and how throughout the 19th century, uh, the Dutch are being able to kind of create a, a way of communicating their own status in, in, in society that is very similar to that of the Japanese PI. And um, perhaps in a talk like this is best illustrated through a visual manner, which is why I have these images right in front of you here. Um, a best way to think about this, or best, a really good example of this, is what the Dutch do with the payung. Um, the payung, as most of you undoubtedly know, is a traditional status symbol, a ceremonial parasol uh, of state. Um, and the Dutch quickly learn, um, for instance, uh, through um, Dipenagoro's experience in the Java War, they quickly learn about the significance of the payung in uh, conveying power and conveying status. And what they do is very deliberately model 
the colonial bureaucracy um, and a payung hierarchy for the colonial bureaucracy after that of Java's principalities. And that's what the image that you see on the left is actually a depiction of the, Jav the, the colonial bureaucracy, right? So this is not from the Japanese principalities. This is uh, what the Dutch created um, meticulously detailed in regulations. You can read all the descriptions in the colonial archives um, where all the colors are signifying for particular meat, they have particular meanings for particular professional groups. But this is what we call the, um, the, the payung hierarchy for the colonial bureaucracy. So it's actually a great example of how we see how the Dutch are adapting um, some, some knowledge from local society to legitimize the strength in their own position. To such an extent, of course, that the highest payung in rank, the gilded payung, um, of course, is the payung of either the Dutch governor general or of Dutch uh, residents. And residents are the basically the district leaders. Um, and that's why we have these two images here next to one another of a Japanese bupati who is uh, dressed up, of course, who is uh, accompanied by his own payung. Um, he's wearing a, a jacket which is by design, uh, also designed by the Dutch authorities, um, signifying he is within the colonial bureaucracy. But we kind of see the similarity between his positioning as well as that of the Dutch resident in 1904, who similarly lets himself be photographed uh, with a servant. Um, note, please, that the servant uh, doesn't wear shoes, that is deliberate, whereas a Dutch official does. Um, and he is the payung bearer, and he holds the gilded payung for the Dutch colonial official. Um, that's also, that picture is also on the cover of the book. It's taken in 1904 in the same year that actually uh, uh, the bearing of parasols by Dutch colonial officials is prohibited. Um, so my uh, suspicion is that this colonial official wanted to quickly take a picture before he was no longer allowed to. Um, so as a, almost as a nostalgic moment of traditional forms of power. But I call this the Javanization of colonial authority. Um, one of my big points here about the Japanization is that this is a very deliberate and intentional process. It's not just a byproduct, let's say, of racial and cultural mixing that's been happening in Indonesia since the 17th century between the Dutch and Indonesians. No, in fact, what happens very clearly in the colonial record is very deliberately in the 19th century, the Dutch are manipulating um, methods from Japanese society and culture to legitimize their own power. Um, and that is where that assumption from um, Sumar Soto's superior comes from, the assumption that Indonesians in his presence are sitting on the floor, that they will address him in high Javanese, that they will uh, show him gestures of obedience, um, that um, they won't look him in the eye when they're speaking, that they will wear traditional clothing that is uh, basically signifying their ethnic but also their inferior status. Uh, all of these are expectations that are created in the 19th century. Um, as I already indicated before, what happens by the late 19th century is really intriguing for various reasons that I discuss in the book. Increasingly, um, colonialism demands a new form of legitimization, right? So the civilizing mission discourse or the ethical policy, the notion that the Dutch have a moral duty to perform in colonial Indonesia, and that becomes the legitimization of power. Um, we see that captured, for instance, in this particular cartoon, which is from 1905, where we have Governor General Van Houts, um, who is most famous actually for uh, his brutal uh, repression in Aceh during the Aceh War. Um, after that, winning the Aceh War, if you will, he was rewarded as the position of Governor General in 1904. In 1905, he tried to create change. He tried to basically um, change the appearance of colonial authority and modernize it. Um, by forcing his colonial officials to get rid of their payung. For instance, here we see he's stomping on the gilded payung of the colonial officials. He's saying, you don't need these symbols. We are going to modernize our colonial regime. We are going to modernize our colonial appearance. We are going to make sure that the ethical policy looks very different than the 19th century Javanization of authority. But as you can see, the colonial official looks startled. Um, and very quick, quickly, uh, even after 1904, when the gilded payungs are prohibited uh, in 1904, 1906, and 1909, uh, uh, General Van Hoots actually uh, um, uh, promulgates several circulars prohibiting European officials from demanding traditional forms of deference from their civil servants and from um, their uh, indigenous subjects, um, but it doesn't work. Um, while the intention here might seem good, colonial officials ignore these circulars. Uh, Japanese officials ignore these circulars. What happens is there is a standoff between the higher authorities within Dutch government. So let's say the authorities in the Netherlands, the authorities in Jakarta or Batavia at that, uh, in that point in time, and the officials on the ground, like residente or assistant residente. Um, and this creates an incredible tension. And, and I call it here kindly the delayed implementation of the ethical policy. 
Perhaps the title of chapter two captures this really much better um, through the eyes of uh, a, a, a Japanese medical student. Um, he calls it an era of sweet was the dream, bitter the awakening. There was this big dream of societal change, but it did not come, it did not happen. And that kind of captures it really well. Um, and that creates tension in society because who now is gonna create this change? Who now is going to um, instigate change? And that brings me back again to Sumer Sono. So while I think we now have a better understanding of where both Sumer Sono and his European superior came from, right? These competing assumptions about this particular encounter, um, I would tell you a little bit more about Sumer Sono because Sumer Sono plays a big role in actually undoing this. Um, he, him and, and many others. But Sumer Sono, uh, it will be too, too we will go too far to say that this is somebody uh, like is an everyday person. He was of noble background. His father was a Bupati, his, or his grandfather was a Bupati. His own father was a public prosecutor. Uh, he himself becomes a public prosecutor. He's very well versed in his PIE background. Um, he is very familiar um, with high Japanese nobility and culture. So this is clearly somebody from, from a, a high status. Uh, he's also a devout Muslim um, and he also enjoys a Western education as a result of his high status. Um, he actually has the privilege of going to a secondary school in Batavia, which is the premier secondary school in, in the city at the time, which is called the Gymnasium Middendri. Uh, you can see a graduating class in 1910 here. Um, in 1901, when he applies to the school, he's only one of four non-Europeans uh, applying to the school out of 148 applicants. Uh, by the time he graduates in 1906, he's the only one non-European left in his graduating class. Um, during his experience here at the school, he is always dressed in European clothing. He learns to speak fluently Dutch. Uh, his European classmates are seemingly friendly with him. Um, they consider him an equal. Um, so he's really having a relatively good time, according to his own written record, at this school. Um, here he also works with um, uh, uh, Godard Hasseu. Hasseu is uh, uh, at that point a mentor at this school, um, but later on he becomes the official advisor for native affairs in the colonial government. And that's going to be important. So there's a personal relationship here between um, Sumer Sono um, and somebody high up in the colonial government later on from this moment. Um, his civil service career after this begins and takes off, he becomes a clerk and slowly but surely he rises to ranks, becomes an assistant public prosecutor and eventually then he gets promoted in February 1913 to the job of public prosecutor in Purwakarta. But that's also the first time that he actually leaves the larger Jakarta region or the larger Batavia region. And that creates kind of a shock because now he leaves Batavia, where he has many European friends, where he is used to speak Dutch, where he's used to be treated as an equal and he suddenly arrives in Purwakarta. And that's kind of what, um, that's kind of where we, where we began this talk, right? With that encounter, with that particular experience. Um, Sumer Sono is persistent and he forces his European superior to come back to him. Sumer Sono is highly educated, so he knows that he has the right on his side. He knows that he is in the right in this conversation. So what happens in early May, 1913 is interesting. Very begrudgingly, his European superior allows Sumer Soto to return back to the court after a delay of two months to return back to the court and sit on a chair. And in the archives, there's this, this beautiful short note. Um, it's very curt in which in two sentences, this colonial official allows the special privilege to Sumer Soto to sit on a chair in his presence. Um, and Sumer Soto saves this note uh, and he's going to use it for, for, you know, for, for, great, you know, for, for great power, if you will, later on, as, as I'll tell you in a second. Um, but at that point in time, you can already feel that the relationship between these two men is, is souring quickly. Um, that also is part in uh, the result of what Super Sono does while he's in Purwakarta, while he's not working at the police court. In that two month interval, he becomes increasingly involved in what, we, what he himself calls association life. While he was living in Batavia, he became a member, member of Budiotomo. In Purwakarta, he becomes a representative of Budiotomo. He also becomes a, one of the founding and one of the leaders of the founding of a local branch of the Sarekat Islam. In fact, uh, uh, the Sarekat Islam in Purwakarta, under his guidance, very quickly gains a fellowship of 15,000 members uh, by the end of 1913. So uh, Sumer becomes incredibly active to the frustration of his European superior. Um, all of this kind of come together in a speech that he gives in May, on May 25th, 1913, um, to commemorate the five year anniversary of Budiotomo. And in this speech, he basically tells uh, you know, the audience that if you want to become equal, if you want to 
do something about the inequality in colonial society. If you want to be equal to the Dutch and to the Chinese, you have to stand up for your rights. You have to demand them. You have to be assertive. We cannot be passive and demand and, and think that things are going to change. You are the only ones who can actually ignite change. And those are his literal words to ignite change. Um, as one example of how people could do this, he argues, just change your outfit. Just wear trousers, wear a, ja a, blanket, uh, a jacket, uh, wear shoes, change your outfit, become and demand change. And it's a very powerful um, a meeting in which uh, several thousand people are in attendance. Um, news of the meeting reaches a European superior who in basically increasingly gets frustrated with Sumer Sono and already uh, accuses him of inciting against the government after this speech. Um, but things get even worse. In July 1913, Sumer Sono uh, deliberately uh, begins to spread um, a document, which probably most of you will know, uh, written by Suwardi Suryaningat, if I were to be a Dutchman, um, is a, a famous pamphlet, um, in all honesty, probably one of the most eloquent pieces of writing that undermined colonial authority and it shows the hypocrisy of the colonial system. Um, for this same pamphlet, Suwardi Suryaningat is actually exiled in this same year. Um, Sumer Sono helps spread this pamphlet in Purakarta. Um, the moment his European superior finds out, he demands Sumer Sono be imprisoned and exiled as well. And it is this moment that Sumer Sono um, is, oh, is, is desperate. And he feels that he's under pressure and he's friends with Suwardi Suryaningat and he feels that he's right now at risk of actually either going to prison or being put in exile. And that's when he collects all his materials, that little note that I just mentioned, all his other correspondence, all the notes that he's been taking over his experiences in Purakarta, and he sends them to his former mentor, Hase, who is now the advisor for Native Affairs. And the advisor for Native Affairs is, is absolutely baffled by what he reads. Um, and I have some, or I should have some quotations here for you um, that are kind of uh, interesting to read in response to this. Hasso reads Sumer Sono's notes, um, and, and he uh, writes, for instance, to the governor general in response to reading Sumer Sono's uh, um, correspondence. And he says um, that it was the arrogance of European officials and their persistence in demanding humiliating forms of deference against the explicit instructions of the previous warm up circulars, circulars prohibiting this kind of behavior, that, and I quote, literally drive our young Javanese to imprudence, anger, vexation, and eventually a pressing desire to rid themselves from such officials." End quote. Hasso also feared increasingly that, and I, um, and I quote, that the Javanese no longer tolerate these humiliations as they used to do. End quote. Um, he also suggested to the governor general that it should be impossible for someone like, and I quote, Assistant Resident Bedding, the name of his official, to have the power to decide individually if a native of modern develop, a development of civilization is allowed to sit on the chair in the company of European officials. So here we have somebody who is clearly outraged by what he, he hears. Um, to, to put this in context, um, I've gone through Hasso's archives. Um, Sumersono's story is not the only one. Hasso collected stories like these. Other uh, stories from Hasso's archives are found in my book, for instance. Um, so what happens to Hasso is it was basically, um, I think in English, the saying is the straw that broke the camel's back. And he gets so angry, he immediately, he receives his correspondence on August 18th. He immediately basically goes to the governor general and says, you have to do something now. August 22nd, that's precisely what happened. A new, what's so-called Hormat circular, a circular that deals with respect, forms of deference and etiquette is uh, uh, basically um, promulgated by the government. But this is an incredibly stern circular, one that scolds civil servants. Um, and it's a really remarkable circular because in the circular, the government admits it is wrong, admits that its civil servants are in the wrong. It is almost an apology for the duration um, since the beginning of the ethical policy in 1901 for the, 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 the basically the time that is taken for this change to come. And it's also a call to action. It actually asks the people to report transgressions against the circular to their superiors. So this is a very unexpected, a very strange government circular that is the result of this particular interaction. Um, what is kind of intriguing about that circular is not the document itself, but it's what happens with the document. The document becomes a very powerful tool um, in the following months that plays its own role in creating broader social change. Um, and, and that's what I wanna talk about for, for a few more minutes um, now.
So one of the side effects of this particular circular is that um, the government is, is very serious at this moment because they are fearful, as Hasso's letter C, right? So this is, you know, we, we, we are allowed to be a bit cynical here, uh, but the colonial government fears the changes. So they rather channel these changes um, than let them happen to them. So uh, in this particular case, they decide therefore um, to work with the Sadiqat Islam. They actually sent the, um, assistant advisor for native affairs, and his name is Rinkes, uh, to Sarakat Islam meetings in late 1913 uh, and early 1914. He travels together with the Sarakat Islam pres president, uh, Choko Aminoto, to these meetings where in front of large audiences, he reads parts of the circular and he asks the people that, or he tells the people that civil servants are there for them, not uh, the other way around. So if there's any transgressions, he demands that you take action, don't stand for it, stand up, let us know, and we will take action for you. And it's a very powerful, um, a very powerful message. Um, if you go through the notes of the first Sayakat Islam meetings, you can actually see that the Hormat circular is one topic that almost always comes back. And the themes that the circular discuss always comes back. It becomes a, a, a sort of a continuing narrative at these meetings. Uh, but something else happens in the vernacular press too that is really important. Um, so far, a lot of these government documents were always only written in Dutch. So this took the frustration to some um, um, young Indonesians who were saying, well, one of the problems is we need to share this news more widely. People need to be able to read this. So for instance, here we have Dunia Bergerak, um, and, and Dunia Bergerak is uh, uh, um, uh, basically a, a kind of a magazine created in nine, early 1914 um, by uh, Marco Cote di Como. And he um, believed that it was important for people to read these words for themselves, to actually read the circular for themselves. So he took the initiative to translating circulars. In this case, here we have in front of us the translation of this government circular. It's not a great document. If you actually are interested in this, on my own website, I have uh, both the Dutch version, the Indonesian version that you see here, or the Malay version, and a English translation of the circular for your convenience. So if you would like to kind of read it in, in whatever language you prefer, uh, you can find it on my personal website. Um, and it's a really interesting document that you'll see, but this is important because uh, what happens is that the pages of Dunia Bergerak are, are filled with references to the Hormat Circular, with transgressions, with pawn shop personnel, with uh, civil servants personnel complaining, with teachers complaining about the way they're being treated. Um, and other writers are then responding to that and they're saying, well, this is what you can do, right? These are the things you could do. For instance, and here we're back at clothing, you can change your outfit. Um, and changing your outfit became an increasingly popular way of demanding equality and respect. And what happens is, is really remarkable in the second half of 1913, um, and I'll, I'll try to wrap it up after this very quickly, Dika, I'm looking at the time. Um, so I'll, I'll try to put a, put a bow around it. But what happens in 1913, I think this is kind of the, the, the intriguing part to me, is that the vernacular press, so newspapers uh, in Malay and Japanese, um, they are filled with very short, sometimes longer exposés, but oftentimes very short notices. Uh, a teacher in Marion changes his, you know, sarong for, uh, for trousers. Poncho personnel in uh, Jogjakarta does the same. Uh, teachers in Bandung do the same. And increasingly what we see is a widespread moment in which a lot of young Indonesians are, are acting almost like Sumer Sono. They're changing their dress to demand respect, to demand equality, to demand change. Um, this particular cartoon, again, from, from, from the Dutch perspective, kind of shows that tension as well, where the Dutch used to believe that um, they could wear uh, Japanese-inspired clothing, in, especially in the domestic sphere. We can see that in uh, the image uh, above, where we have a, Jav uh, a European woman wearing sao and kabaya, um, the European man wears batik trousers. Um, and this is, of course, a moment we see um, an Indonesian squatting, taking off their hat, deep respect. This is kind of the nostalgic, idealized worldview, according to the colonizer. But of course, now, uh, increasingly, it becomes important for Europeans to, um, to demonstrate their own modernity. Because the moment that Indonesians are starting to wear trousers and suits, um, Europeans really can no longer wear, even in a private sphere, things as a sao and kabaya or batik trousers. So what we see happening is in response to this is that the Europeans are trying to become even more modern and they become even more mesmerized with modern outfits, for instance, as we can see in this image here. Um, but also as this image captures, it's not working. The Japanese in this picture is standing, he's not taking off his hat, he's not showing them um, um, respect. Um, 
this lines up to this, this conflict of what I call then the competing modern modernities or the, the competing um, notions of, of modern identity. Um, as a side note to, to this notion of contesting sartorial hierarchies, uh, here too, uh, in Dunia Bergerac, we find the publication, for instance, of a, what is called the Dress Circular, which originally was published in 1905, but very few people actually knew about it, which specifically states that uh, uh, non-Europeans are allowed to wear European dress. Um, traditionally in Indonesia, as part of the Japanization of colonial power, Japanization of colonial power, um, people in Indonesia were supposed to wear their ethnic garb, and that was legally uh, um, ingrained in police regulations. So if you would not wear ethnic garb, you could actually be fined or even imprisoned. Um, in 1905, that is canceled as part of the ethical policy. But here again, we have an example of where that in itself becomes increasingly published in 1913 and 1914 to really emphasize to people, you are allowed to do this. You are in the right, and you can use this to demand respect. Um, this leads then in the 1920s and 30s, as I said at my opening, but, but I'll go a bit faster here, to um, increasing competition about modern identities. So my last two chapters in my book deal with essentially the consequences of this breakaway, this disruption of the colonial performance, where Europeans are increasingly trying to perform their modernity, but in respect or in response to that modernity, we see that Indonesians are formulating their own answers to this modern identity, and they're trying to shape it in various ways. Um, and here, for instance, we have uh, the example of uh, consumerism, very well illustrated. Uh, of course, this is a government-funded um, periodical, Panji Pustaka. Um, but here we have, of course, an image showing an Indonesian man who is nicely dressed in a European suit. He's wearing trousers, a nice jacket, a tie. He's taking a taxi cab. He's enjoying uh, first-class tickets to the cinema. But of course, he is living above his means. So he's punished for that by actually having to go to the pawn shop. Um, and these kinds of Basically, political cartoons are, are, are found anywhere in the colonial as well as the vernacular press. And it speaks to these tensions around these kind of um, conversations. Um, the final thing, of course, is that spaces are important here. The fairgrounds are, are perhaps one of the most intriguing spaces where we can see these kinds of um, experimentations with identity um, happening. Um, but given the time, I will, I will end here. Um, and I will be more than happy to answer any questions and to talk much more about um, these issues with you uh, this morning. Um, there we go. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Van der Meer. Very intriguing uh, project indeed. Uh, I welcome everyone. If uh, you have questions, you can raise your hand. I will uh, give you the space or you can type your questions in the chat. Uh, basically, feel free to engage in this uh, discussion session. Uh, I actually could start the questions. I'm uh, very interested in the connections that you were making with what happened in the past during uh, this idea that the fashions were regulated and there is this resistance with the, uh, the last part of your talk, which is like forging the modern identity. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, what mechanisms are there beside through this uh, advertisement, right? That connect both stories between the past and during the end of the colonialism. Yeah. So, so thank you, Dika, for that question. I mean, there's, there's, there's uh, one of the things that I find most striking is that you see the first one conversations about lifestyle. Um, so whether I look at, um, I've looked at a lot of women's journals, for instance, but also other journals where um, people are talking about new norms of sexuality, for instance, or uh, concerns about mixed marriage or concerns about the system of concubinage that was prevalent in, in earlier times, um, concerns about um, Western dances, for instance, um, but also concerns about things as um, forms of consumption, whether we're talking about alcohol consumption, but also consumerism itself. So in terms of products, um, consumerism increasingly became a really good way of uh, basically uh, communicating your identity um, and who you believe you were, right? So it's not just about clothing. It's also about other experiences. What kind of restaurants do you eat in? Uh, what kind of products do you consume? What kind of you know, things can you purchase? Um, increasingly we see in at least that's my reading through periodicals and newspapers see an obsession with um, kind of a, a creating a middle class lifestyle um, where consumerism and consumer identity becomes a really important way of 
um, of communicating um, um, identity. So I think that those are other ways where, where we can kind of see that. I hope that kind of answers your question. Yep, yep, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, does anyone else have uh, questions for Dr. Van der Meer? If not, I will just go ahead with my uh, second question. Uh, I'm very interested, like at the beginning in the story of uh, Sumarzano and the parasol. You mentioned that at some point, uh, Dutch officers are no longer allowed to bear the parasol. I'm just because I assume this has happened before the ethical uh, policy in place, uh, what or, or during the ethical policy in place. I'm just wondering what. Uh, what motivated these changes in, in policy? Yeah, so, so I went pretty pretty fast there. And one of the interesting aspects there, so the ethical policy officially is announced in 1901. Um, right. And the announcement for the sort of the, 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 the prohibition on payungs uh, follows in 1904. Um, and the thinking behind it is if you, at least if you read kind of the kind of the, the, the official records, um, is that the Dutch authorities, like, like the governor general, the advisor for native affairs, the authorities in the Netherlands themselves, wanted to create a much more modern colonial form of governance. Um, so they want to modernize not just the government itself, right, through the ethical policy and the policies that it would pursue, but also the appearance of colonial authority. Um, and they felt that to be a modern colonial power, you could no longer rely on these traditional forms of deference or these traditional forms of power. Um, so in this particular case, they felt that the Payung was no longer a part of this. And they also felt that based on, on a lot of experiences that a lot of European officials were, um, they were abusing the power that came with carrying the Payung. They were abusing their status. They started to behave more like feudal lords as they called it, uh, instead of civil servants. So it was a symbolic, and a very targeted action to kind of force European officials to become just that, yeah, officials, civil servants, rather than feudal or signural um, lords in, in colonial society. Um, of course, it backfires. It, it, doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't really uh, work initially, and it takes a little while. Um, for instance, you know, there's a large frustration under European officials who are feeling that, well, like the one on the cover of my book, who is super happy with his parasol, it's a nostalgic moment for him, but then he's frustrated that, let's say, the Bupati and the other uh, Japanese officials are still carrying their own payungs. Um, but it also places Indonesian officials in a difficult position because, let's say, if you're going to meet with this Dutch official, are you then going to bring your payung and create a possible uh, a moment of conflict? Um, so we have numerous stories where a lot of uh, Indonesian officials basically decide not to use their payung whenever in the neighborhood of a European official. To uh, so, so there's there's a whole history there to be to be told and to be written um, that is I think really interesting. Um, so I hope I hope that kind of gets to that. Yeah, to what you're asking. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I'm still looking forward if anyone would like to jump in and have any question. Uh, all right, I actually have my last questions uh, as well. Uh, if you can talk more, because uh, I, I read uh, Heather Sutherland in the book about, you know, uh, how PIA is starting adopting the bureaucratic systems uh, of the colonial government. I'm just wondering if, how your story is in line with her story in the making of these modern uh, bureaucrats, whether the fashion is part of that uh, emergence and what are the resistance going on as uh, local bureaucrats adopting not only the modern bureaucratic systems introduced by the Dutch, but just are there necessarily like uh, connecting uh, stories between the two, book, the two books? Yeah, I think especially in my first chapter, there's a lot of overlap with um, um, Heather Sutherland's studies on on uh, PIE culture and and sort of the, um, the sort of the creation of the bureaucratic state or the colonial state. Um, I think her her focus is is, is, a, is a bit different than mine, right? I'm really focusing on how power is legitimized, right? How the Dutch are working towards. Um, you know, the, this Javanization of power. Um, so I'm not as much interested in the institutional nature uh, itself of the civil service. Um, but, but I think, you know, she was one of the first to actually talk about some of these aspects, right? She was one of the first to talk about these tensions that emerged as the Dutch were trying to do this and try to codify, codify these things. 
Um, there, there are several things that are happening, of course, in the 19th century that are that are interesting to look for is that on the one hand, as the, 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 the PI become ingrained in the colonial bureaucracy, um, they also actually lose power. Right. So so and Heather Sutherland already noticed it. And I, I think that's actually a really important part of, of her book is that on the one hand, they, you know, they get hereditary rights, they get uh, a higher pay, they get uh, um, you know, ways in which they can actually make more money, especially in the age of the cultivation system. But on the other hand, they are also turning into civil servants. They're also increasingly becoming um, pawns within the colonial state. So they're actually losing power, um, especially when in the later half of the 19th century, we get more powerful European officials on the scene. Um, and one way in which then uh, these PI are compensated is by actually getting more symbolic power from the Dutch, right? So they, they are allowed to have larger retinues. They are allowed to carry more uh, symbols of power with them as they are traveling or touring their districts, for instance. Um, so there is a paradox at work here where um, a loss of real power is being compensated. Um, and, and this is not necessarily my argument. I'm, I'm, I show how this works, but Heather Sutherland already pointed this out, how the PI are compensated with symbolic power rather than real power, whereas the real power is siphoned off to the Dutch. Um, and, and that tension, I think, is really important. The other element that, that I think your question goes at in terms of fashion and clothing, I mean, I think it's uh, really interesting to think about um, um, you know, the, the sartorial hierarchy, right? So part of what happens in the 19th century is also um, there are very detailed regulations about who can, can wear what, right? That's all, everything is codified in, in, in great detail, um, even to the official, you know, costumes of PI, um, but also uh, for just regular people, what can you wear? Um, you can look up at the police regulations, for instance, that they stipulate the precise fines that you'll get if you are not um, um, complying with this. Um, but in the late 19th century, of course, we do have increasingly more people who are trying to experiment with their with their outfits and they're trying to find this um, this, this tension. Um, but yeah, I write, I write about that specifically in chapter four, I believe, to, to, you know, to, to give that more context. But uh, but all of these stories are, are intertwined. So, yeah, I hope Dika, that gets to to your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Van der Meer. Uh, we have a question in the chat, uh, the last one that I'm going to uh, read. This is from Amrina Rosheda. Uh, he, she is a PhD student at Northwestern in Anthropology. He is, she was asking, uh, what are the challenges that you faced in writing this book, either methodological or theoretical? And how does studying about colonial resistance change or challenge your fierce understanding about history? Oh, thank you, that's a wonderful question. Um, well, I think as, as most of you know, I think there's always this issue of language, um, right? When studying the colonial period in Indonesia. Um, so for, for me, it meant uh, uh, learning Indonesian, but for instance, for, for Indonesians, it will mean learning Dutch, right? So there's, there's I, I think till this day, that's kind of a colonial legacy, really. Um, one of my, my big challenges was how do you find examples of everyday resistance? And how do you find these stories? Where do you find them? Um, and one of the things that, that I found most helpful was I discovered, and, and they're actually digitized. For those of you who are interested, I'm more than happy to, to share a link with Dika later on. They're digitized by the Dutch um, um, Royal Library. These are censorship reports, as I call them, uh, by the Dutch colonial state of the vernacular press. Um, so the goal of these censorship reports was to write very short kind of you know, pieces on what was being written in the vernacular press. And it's one of the few ways in which we can actually have a really good overview of the vernacular press, even if it's through the eyes of the colonial state, right? We have to always be mindful that this is through the eyes of the colonial state. So what I've been doing is these are thousands of pages and I've gone through all of them. And then I discovered they were digitized after this, after the fact. Um, but I've used those censorship reports and took elaborate notes to then locate uh, both in Indonesia and in um, the Netherlands and here in the US at places like Cornell University, for instance, um, where I could find holdings or microfilms holdings of, of vernacular publications like newspapers or Indonesian periodicals. And I would uh, then look for those. So I would go with that little snippet of a censorship report and look for the original articles in these documents. And that was for me a really great way of actually getting a lot of these examples here. Um, but it, 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 it's very elaborate. 
but as I was doing it, and it goes, I, I think, back to this notion of a challenge um, for, for Amrina. Um, so again, thanks for your question, is that this, this I've discovered like, so one of the best ways perhaps to study the vernacular press to really get a sense is then actually to have to read Dutch censorship reports. Um, and that would then lead you to Indonesian or Javanese language or Sudanese language newspapers. Um, and this is, I think, still one of the big challenges for anybody studying this era in, 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 um, um, in Indonesian history. Um, I feel that I'm forgetting part of your, your question. I mean, I think also about how does it change um, my understanding of history or... Um, yeah. Is that correct? So I think for me, what, what I really enjoyed of this process is you, you go in with certain questions, but as I was going through it, I increasingly became convinced that you know, the, the everyday encounters in the colonial societies are till this day understudied, um, right? So, so what, what does it actually mean to live um, in colonial societies? That in itself is I think something that we still have to get a far better grasp on. Um, and, and the other thing for me is um, how everyday encounters are, are then a, basically a way for us to start to understand dynamics of power. Um, and for instance, this is on a complete tangent here, uh, but for Cornell University Press, I also wrote a short blog, uh, for instance, on how, you know, think of, of all the conversations here in the United States about face masks today, right? And how, whether you wear a face mask or you don't wear a face mask and whether you do that inside or outside or, you know, all of this is communicating something about us, about our beliefs or about who we are. And it's, um, to me, I think in general in history, I think it will be really good for us to start studying these kinds of daily interactions and to see what we can learn from them and how it changes our understanding of history. In my case, I, I truly, truly believe that the National Awakening in Indonesia was much broader mental transformation than we previously assumed. Um, and, and that's something that, that I will take away from, from having done this study. Thank you so much uh, for a wonderful answer. Uh, we have one other question actually from Muhammad Sultan. If you would like to uh, raise your questions, please. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm, I think this question is a bit outside of the topics uh, today, but one thing that made me interested with this today's topics, it's uh, something like uh, infrastructure that been left by the colonials, uh, Dutch colonial is uh, like uh, in the Dendel's uh, governance, they built Anjer Panarukan uh, roads. And that's uh, 100 years before the uh, our nationalities uh, uh, era. So do you think how Dutch colonials inheriting the spirits from the generation to generation to build the uh, the, the, the Indonesians and what values that can be uh, wrap it up. Uh, so do you think what things that been uh, inheriting to the uh, colonial generations? Uh, could you, thank you. Just, yeah, no, thank you so much for your question. Could you clarify, are we, you talk more about in, in terms of, of uh, infrastructure, do you mean more, more physical infrastructure or more kind of mental uh, inheritance? Um, like... Yeah, it's kind of like more uh, in the mentals. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and then more from the perspective of the colonizer in this case, right? From the, from the Dutch. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, so I think what is so interesting about all of this is you know, the, the, the way that Dutch scholars and I think also Dutch society have, has thought about colonialism has changed dramatically over time. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure, I'll be honest, I'm not sure if I'm getting at your, your, your question, um, but, but I do think that, you know, the, the, the consequences of these histories are, are very tangible till this day. Um, and, and they have kind of reverberated, you know, th through the present. Um, and we can see that too. And, and, um, I can see that at least you know in, in contemporary the Netherlands where there's a lot of there's a lot of people struggling still with this past right and trying to get to understand this past and learning much more about this past that um, is uh, is happening but yeah I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your your, your question correctly Mohammed so uh, yeah so I would love to talk more about this yeah yeah thank you so much uh, Jeffrey please sure thank you um... Thanks for a terrific talk. Uh, it's really uh, illuminating and congratulations on the book. Um, Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, my question is, uh, is about who it is that you're mainly talking about. So, mm -hmm. so there's this effort, first of all, to move away from overt, potentially mass political resistance as being, um, as being the only evidence of resistance. There's so much more uh, evidence of resistance going on. I think that's a really important move. Um, and as you're going through your cases and the, and, the, and the evidence you're presenting, are you predominantly talking about elite to elite um, interactions? Um, uh, so it's, it looks like from the, you know, it looks like partly what's going on is you have an intra-Dutch uh, process going on, which is trying to get a policy among bureaucrats throughout the system to be followed and resistance to that. Um, and then there are the um, PIE elites uh, and how they are acting and how they are dressing and their posture and so on. Um, and then there are images in the pictures in the background of very ordinary people. Um, and I guess I'm, I guess I'm wondering where are you positioning the dynamic and the level? Um, and how, how much interaction was there in your view, sort of just scale and quantitatively between Dutch actors and very ordinary people, as opposed to those interactions being mediated by elite Indonesians. Um, so if you could just give me, a, give me an idea of, or give us an idea of sort of where you're positioning this dynamic. Yeah, thank you, Jeffrey. That's a, that's a great question. <laughs> um, because so I, I think so the way that I look at this, I see it developing in my book, right? So in, in my own work, and it has to do with, with several factors. Um, it has simply to do with the availability of, of materials. So um, in, in the, I would say in the 19, the first two chapters, even the third on uh, the beginning of the third chapter, when I talked for instance about Sumer Sono, it's really this elite narrative, right? So we're still kind of in the level of, um, you know, the, the Dutch, but also the Priyai. Oftentimes, these are either very elite Priyai who um, have taken on kind of notions of modernity, who really kind of challenge you know, like traditional culture, or they're actually a little bit more uh, a lower class Priyai who find that they are falling behind both, you know, Priyai culture as well as colonial culture. So that's why they are disgruntled and they're, but this is still very much a world of, let's call them young, educated. Um, uh, Javanese and Indonesians, right? They're, they're, these are people who, just as Sumer Sono, have enjoyed a master of education, who have a, a you know, they're, they're, they're young professionals. Um, but in the 1910s and 20s, I noticed through the vernacular press, and that's also when the vernacular press becomes, you know, flourishes, I get much more stories and much more narratives um, that I do think deal much more with well, let's call them more, more ordinary people. Um, with a big quantification that it is still foremost urban people, right? So a lot of my work does focus on Java cities. Um, so and that, of course, means that a vast majority of people, you know, the peasants or workers on plantations, um, are are still outside the scope of this work. Um, I would have loved to do, uh, for instance, uh, more on on these relationships on let's say plantations, where there's are tea plantations or sugar plantations or um, also in the late, you know, early 20th century in, in, you know, in, in Aceh, for instance, kind of to see if the same kind of dynamics would work there. Um, but I didn't, that, that was not part of the project. But I do think that in the 1910s and 20s and 30s, increasingly, and that's also, let's say, in those images that you saw at the end, you can see kind of more like, like the visitors to the fairgrounds. Um, and here I became much more, uh, I write much more about the emergence of what I call a, a Indonesian middle class. Um, and this is a much broader concept than just the, the, the PI uh, leadership. Um, for a, I worked on a project together with some of you might might know of this with Hank Schulte Nordholt, um, who is a historical anthropologist uh, about kind of the emergence of the Indonesian middle classes. And for instance, in this, this moment we estimated, and now I have to very quickly 
I think we estimated at that point in time that's about 500,000 to, 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 to a million people who would have fallen in that category. Um, and I think so, I go, like, like to be fair, I do think I go from the kind of more elite study, transition to the book to a study focused more on that group of people. Um, that becomes, I think, the focus of my, my, my work. Um, and, and that's kind of a number. If you want a number, that's kind of a number that you could put on there. In terms of how often do the Dutch, you know, interact with with Indonesians um, in the 19th century, not as much. Uh, and a lot of those interactions are through um, um, Indonesian intermediaries. Um, so you're absolutely right there, right? So that's why the civil service relations are so important. Um, that changes in the early 20th century when um, the Dutch presence uh, in an island like Java uh, surpasses almost uh, the 250,000. Um, and again, especially in its major cities, right? That's where you find them. Um, but there you can focus also on, on interactions both on the street or in, in trains or in train stations or in movie theaters, um, fairgrounds, as I mentioned, um, or also even in the household with household servants. Um, so suddenly there, there is you find many more of these, these interaction or interactions, which I couldn't even include in, in this study, an article that I'm working on right now, um, the interactions between Indonesians and Europeans in mountain resorts, right? So kind of in the, uh, the, the resorts where Europeans would go um, for, for recuperation, as they call it. But there too, of course, uh, are these interactions. Um, so I think that that is... I hope, yeah, yeah, that, I hope that kind of addresses your answer, Jeffrey, but it's a, it's a great question, but I think that's, um, yeah, so it, it's an increasingly larger group um, as it develops uh, in the book. Thank you, that's very helpful, thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have another questions from Lutfi Adam. Uh, if you can be sharp in your questions, really appreciate it. Uh, hi, Arnott. Um, well, I'm, 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 I'm very, I'm very, I'm very happy. Uh, basically, because uh, to be honest, I started um, learning about history because I read Dunia Bergerak. Um, and uh, one of my first uh, historical questions was uh, why and how did, um, how, why and how did, uh, you know, Indonesian journalists and activists uh, like Marco um, transform their, 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 you know, dressing style uh, from from a more traditional Japanese into like Western style. Um, I, I, I wrote a, a, a paper about that, but um, so, so basically I'm, I'm very happy to, 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 uh, to listen to your talk today and to also to, uh, uh, to, to read uh, some, uh, uh, some parts of, of, of your book. I, I read your, your chapter or, or on uh, Sumarsono. Um, yeah. Um, in uh, the Journal of World History, oh, yeah. right? Um, yes, yeah. I'm, 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 I was very happy in, uh, to, to read that. Um, so basically, I'm, I'm a dunia bergerak and Marco enthusiast. <laughs> um, I'm con continuing questioning uh, about uh, uh, the role of uh, dress transf transformation in, in, you know, the making of. Um, in the making of pergerakan, basically um, um, the movement, right? Um, uh, but but I I I'm I'm sure um, many of my questions have been answered in in your book. <laughs> um, so for today's discussion, um, I'm interested to just follow up uh, Jeffrey's uh, question about you know um, about the um, uh, the positioning that your that that you uh, that, that you choose um, um, uh, in narrating um, the 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 actors in this you know historical period um, in Dunia Bergerak, as you know, we read a lot about uh, the term Wong Cilik, right? Um, the the, yeah. the Wong Cilik, and how uh, people like Marco and his fellows um, were try trying to kind of uh, representing themselves themselves as um as the um as Wong Chilik themselves right and also as um a, a group who advocate the interests of Wong Chilik right in in front of the the, the colonial uh, authorities so I'm, I'm wondering about um how how do you see uh, you know what is Wong Chilik uh, and then you know who are these pergerakan people um, because 
um, if we if we still see you know the the historical actors in terms of you know elite versus common people for example i think this is this was the, the period when when some indonesian actors or 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 even some indo or even some europeans uh, were trying to kind of you know um change um the change the 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 uh, change the um the colonial society in terms of you know the status um um and so on right um so i i'm just wanted to follow up how how do you see you know this warm chili terms and and how do you see these actors if we if we also remember that they also tried to at least you know uh, uh perform in front of the colonial society as Wong chilik themselves and also try to advocate the interest of Wong chilik thank you arna yeah, thank you. So that's first of all, I would love to read your paper. Uh, <laughs> that sounds like a wonderful paper topic. And um, uh, don't, don't be afraid. There is much, much, much more to be written about uh, about these histories. So, uh, uh, um, but yeah, do please read chapter four, uh, which is all deals with questions about clothing and dress. And I think your question is is, is wonderful. It's very you know, pertinent to to this topic because I think there are several things going on here. Um, on, on one hand, increasingly. Uh, the, the tension that I mentioned earlier, where uh, you know some people for various reasons feel unease with with their either their PIA role or with PIA in general, um, and and they increasingly begin to distance themselves from um, let's call it a a you know how you call that an, um, a society of 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 uh, not classes but of stands right of standing or of um, the word eludes me right now, um, so my apologies, but I, I hope you get my, my direct, more the feudal organization of society, and they become champions of the common people, the Wong Chilik, right, they, they become champions, but what is interesting to me about this is that while on the one hand they want to champion the cause of the common people, on the other hand they also want to present themselves as really modern, right, and us, they're presenting a new identity, they're arguing, um, so what I like about this, at least the way that I read them, is they're also very forward looking, right? They're progressive thinking. Um, so they say, we will stand for the rights of the, of the common people. We uh, will direct the country in a particular direction in a particular future. Um, and that's also what they're trying to signal through their clothing choices. Um, you know, the Sumer Sono quite literally did just that during that Sara Kataslam, or, or sorry, during that, that speech that he gave uh, for the commemoration of Buri Otomo, simply saying, this is how you can do it. You can do this too, right? You can wear trousers as well. You can wear these clothes. Similar things are happening at, at Sara Kataslam meetings where people are talking about, you know, clothing as a way to um, um, you know, basically signal new identities. Um, what is extra interesting in this regard is that, of course, we have very competing narratives emerging, right? So we have Marco's narrative that we read, um, but we have also competing narratives, um, some that are much more based, let's say, in Islamic uh, morality, right? Or, or what we might call Islamic modernism, especially then was really a popular movement. Um, we have other uh, um, ideas that, that, that have, have different kind of causes. So we see, uh, especially in the late 1910s, early 20s, there are too a lot of conversations about how dress can actually, on the one hand, uh, articulate a new, broader identity for the people, right? So, so I think the common people very quickly becomes the people, um, as opposed to the elites. Um, so it's a very good mechanism. Um, but there's diverging paths, right? There's diverging visions for the future. So we can actually see those um, competing interests there. I mean, um, of course, perhaps another great example of this is Sukarno, um, right? Um, who introduced uh, uh, the patchy as a, a very quintessential element of this costume. On the one hand, he's modern, but he's very clearly um, bringing in this much lower class uh, item that signifies, right? I am of the people, right? I'm here for you, but I'm also a modern leader. I'm also going to bring you uh, this particular future. Um, so that's how I, I, I hope that kind of gets to your question, but that's how I look at it. And I find those competing fissions so interesting. Um, and that's what, what that chapter five kinds of get at, but I would love to do more research on it because um, there is not a single Indonesian nationalist movement, right? right? And this is a multifaceted movement, right? With that many different groups and many different interests and many different visions for the future, which is also, I think, really important already to articulate in the 20s and 30s if you want to understand what happens, let's say, in the 50s and 60s in Indonesia, right? Because the, 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 those moments don't just come out of the, the blue, they actually have their roots in this moment in time. 
Um, so yeah, I think that that's kind of, yeah. So, so I think I'll leave it at that. I, I could talk much more about, about clothing, which I would love to do, but I hope that kind of, yeah, answers your question. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, thank you so much, thank Dr. You. Dr. Van der Meer. And uh, everyone, please join me uh, to thank Dr. Van der Meer for his time. And also thank you for joining from Indonesia as well. I saw a lot of participants are coming from that time zone. Uh, you were staying up late. I really appreciate that. And I also would like to thank uh, Beth Morrissey and uh, Professor Jack Jeffrey Winters at EDGS that makes this talk possible. Uh, since we have only eight minutes left, we will quickly transition into the informal uh, part of our talk. Uh, we will stop recording at this time. But if you have